um, thank you for coming. Oh yeah, and just before we, I was just about to mention that if you are um, comfortable, we are going to record this please, because it's um, something that we will put up Karen will explain a little bit more about the project. What we're doing today fits into um, the Post Qualitative Research Collective and she'll explain in a brief, in a minute. So we want this to be an interactive um, afternoon. As I said, the program does say we'll be on a bit longer, but we're actually just gonna be on from four to five, maybe just a couple of minutes later. But um, what we'd like you to do is engage with the two um, participants, Karen Morris and Brandon Reynolds. And you know, feel free to ask them questions that are out there, um, descriptions and dis and the conversation, so that we can make this. Um, you know, if you're going, wait, wait, I don't understand, or I'm really interested in that, or that's something I also do. Then we'd like you to just stop and and interrupt them and be part of that conversation. So, I'm going to um, thank you. I'm just admitting some people in as we're going along. You're welcome to put your video on wave and then go back. Uh, but please feel free to keep it on, feel free to keep it on when you speak. So that's enough from me. Um, I'm Dr. Roseanne Reynolds and I'm very excited to be here this afternoon. I'm going to be just doing, prompting Karen and Brandon to chat a little bit more about the Post-Human Child Manifesto and for the recording, that is something that you can all find on our YouTube, um, well, not on our YouTube videos, but you can find it on YouTube under the Post-Human Child Manifesto, and I'm sure many of you have seen that, and we can pop it into the chat later as well. So I'm going to hand over to Karen now and ask her to introduce the project, please. And when Karen's finished introducing the project, Brandon, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, and then, um, and I think Karen would have introduced herself while she introduces the project. Thanks so much. Thanks, Karen. Okay, thank you, Roseanne. Uh, Dr. Reynolds. <laughs> um, yes, and and in particular, also thank you for for running this uh, webinar series, which is a series with a difference, an important difference. It is part of the Post Qualitative Research Collective um, Research Project, which is uh, funded by the National Research Foundation of uh, South Africa. It's a three-year project, and the main aim of the project is to build a collective of members and friends. There's not a huge difference between them, but the members are the ones who basically started it off at a conference. They were sitting around the table, and we thought, we really, really need to have the kind of support as supervisors, as students, to do post-qualitative research in academia around the world. So this was at the American Education Research Association conference. I, I, it feels like years ago. It was pre-COVID, so that says it all. You know, it was like it feels like in another lifetime. And and also the first year, the NRF didn't think it. Uh, well, they thought it was a really um, good project to fund, but they didn't have the money. But the year after, they did. And uh, Roseanne uh, Reynolds is the co-PI um, of this project, and Viv uh, Boselek, who's also here in the room, is the co-investigator. And we've got um, loads of members, loads of friends, which is fabulous. And it is, the meetings that we have are different. We are not presenting. They are not like webinars where uh, we have presented, uh, I don't know, and there's nothing wrong with that, but this is just something different. And it is, for people who know Karen Barad's work, it is a returning to work that we've already done, coming to it afresh, uh, see what, uh, what new it, it generates. But in particular, it is a way of getting to know each other as members of this collective. So you may, may see that I've just come out of the water. <laughs> just don't really look um, much. Um, and, and it's that also deliberately of, not <laughs> that I did it deliberately, but it was, I didn't, I wasn't, too bothered about it because the whole idea of it is also if you have to get up or you need to make a cup of tea or I don't know you want to look the other way please feel free you don't have to be in the center of the screen and looking at us uh, but you can you know just feel what makes you feel comfortable but it will be great also during this hour that if you want to say something or comment or a question please 
feel free to do so. It is meant to be like a conversation, um, the kind of conversation that we would have had, hopefully, if we had met each other at a, a conference or a workshop and the kind of chat that you do when you go and get your coffee and your biscuits. And that is really the idea of these kind of meetings. Now, uh, we've had some incredible uh, returning webinars that you can find on the Post Qualitative Research Collective website. I don't know whether um, I will put it in the chat in a minute, the link to the, or maybe could you do that, uh, Roseanne, to the, uh, to the website itself. And that's also where you can find under events or the next ones. And in particular, if you are keen to, I don't know, return to something you've written and new thoughts that you might have about it or together with someone else that you maybe have co-written and you want to talk about the process of writing. The whole idea of it is that we take a little bit the sting out of the academic work that we need to do as post-qualitative researchers. And you might be very experienced and you might be just starting. It's perfectly fine, you know, we're here to have those conversations. So please feel free to open your Zoom. Um, it would be just really nice that we can actually make contact in that way, but at the same time, you know, don't feel forced to do so, but it would just be wonderful to, to talk to people, there, at least that there is some movement on the screens and not just names. Probably this is as much as I want to say, apart from, do I also need to introduce myself, Roseanne? Yeah. So I am a professor of early childhood education at the University of Oulu in Northern Finland, where it is, I don't know, very cold. It's very, very, a lot of snow and I think it's minus 20. And on the other still is actually at the moment, as you probably can see from my dress, I am in South Africa at the moment where I've also got an academic role. I'm an emeritus professor of uh, education here at the University of Cape Town. And I've been here five weeks now and still another week to go, uh, running uh, actually in total four uh, research projects. So I'm still very, very much um, uh, attached in all sorts of ways to South Africa and probably will remain like that, I hope so. Um, so I'm, I've got my feet in both uh, the North and, uh, and the South. So I'm just going to hand over. I will say a little bit more about the context of the manifesto, but probably not right now. But uh, please tell me if I do have to, um, Dr. Reynolds. Stop you, Shana. <laughs> we can drop the doctor now. I just like it occasionally. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Just use it for a bit. <laughs> Using it just for a bit. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Brandon Reynolds. And in terms of, yeah, we'll... Bren, would you like to introduce yourself, please, to the quite a new audience to you? We know some of the people here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Brandon Reynolds. Um, Roseanne and I are married, just to get that out of the way first. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, I've, I've been sort of part of this journey of his for quite a few years and um, got to know some of the... Uh, uh, the nuts and bolts of this post qualitative research that they uh, post, I'm not even going to try and say it, <laughs> um, uh, that they were involved in. Uh, so basically, I'm a cartoonist. I draw editorial cartoons for uh, Business Day here in South Africa and the Sunday Times. So that keeps me fairly busy, but I do um, a couple of, I suppose, some side projects, and I, I, I quite enjoy doing animation and I've been learning about that the last uh, few years and um, so so in 2018 when uh, when Karen I suppose proposed this uh, idea to me um, I was I was uh, quite uh, yeah I felt quite challenged it was uh, an area that I was going to need to put quite a lot of work in so it was quite a, a approach it with a bit of trepidation but um, but I, I like I said my my background is in editorial cartooning, which is all about coming up with ideas or different ways of, of showing how things look, and um, and and, I, and, I, and a huge part of it is trying to understand the, the issue and and the, the you know in in as much depth as possible, so I can 
I can kind of uh, come up with something visual that accompanies it. So, um, uh, so yeah, so Karen's manifesto was uh, uh, was was quite a challenge to uh, turn into a visual. So that's what I eventually did, and uh, I believe all of you have uh, experienced it in some level or watched it over the last few years, as it's been available since about 2018. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's all I want to say about my introduction and just to introduce myself. But uh, yeah, we'll I'll let the chair take it from here. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so over to you again, Karen. And I, I'd like to ask you, um, or I'll ask you to ask yourself and ask Brandon, why did you ask Brandon to do um, this particular kind of work with your manifesto? And how did that all come about? So maybe you could tell the story of how you got your post-human manifesto and then how the collaboration between you and Brandon. Okay, so I'm, ooh, it's, my so I can't actually remember exactly when I was yeah when I was promoted to full professor I think that was 2016 or 2015 I'm not quite sure but then there was roads must fall and fees must fall and so there were no inaugurals for new newly appointed uh, professors uh, for people who don't know that when you become a professor you need to profess at some point, um, so otherwise my people might not believe, well, why is this person now appointed as professor? But in the name professor, you profess something. So what is it you profess? And I, I was intrigued by the, what is it that I profess? Um, and how can you put that like in a, in a kind of a stock cube? And I had a lot of time to think about it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, now and again, I said to I asked UCT as well, I said, you know, is it coming at some point? Because the last thing that I wanted is like, oh, yeah, it, it's next month or so. You know, I really wanted to give it time. And why was that important, important for me was that uh, inaugurals often very much focus on the research of a person. And, you know, being um, a critical post-humanist and maybe prefer now to call myself an agential realist, I, I just really didn't want to be right in the center. And also I didn't think that was fair in terms of doing justice to what had made it possible uh, for me to profess whatever it, I was professing. And also not just because I'm in early childhood education, but I think a lot of my research is very visual anyway, and it works with the visual in a different way. Um, the picture books I'm passionate about are picture books that have illustrations that are works of art and do something uh, not just illustrate the words but they actually offer something uh, often disrupt the text or, or play with the text so with the words I mean text of course is much broader and I knew of Brandon's work. Um, I followed it on Facebook. Uh, I went to a workshop once uh, for teachers and you know, drawing and making cartoons, absolutely fascinated by Brandon's ability to make very political, very poignant points, points even that, in 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 a drawing, you know, in um, in such a accomplished and talented way. And I just thought, wow, you know, what if, um, what if he says yes, if I ask him to, uh, and the details, I don't know exactly uh, of that, but I thought, it, wouldn't it be amazing if instead of me talking about my research, I could somehow present it as a cartoon as um, something visual that would not only sort of communicate, but would really affect um, the audience. And I wanted it to be a manifesto. I wanted it to, to shout out and to, you know, this, this was my opportunity, right? So people are listening to me, they have to listen to me. Um, and, you know, the VC is going to be there. And, you know, I want people to, to really take in what the, this scholarship is about, which is really disrupting the adult child binary. And so that was sort of one side of it, but also I wanted to show that it wasn't just theory, although it's very much philosophical work, but also that we were 
enacting the philosophy in our teacher education program. And Roseanne and Joanne Pierce were lecturers on that program. And so they were also involved in presenting, you know, some of the, uh, the amazing work that we've done with our students and uh, as an enactment of it. And Roseanne and I, Roseanne has promised that we also write a book about that. So we should. But I think what, uh, so it was all sort of coming together and the disruption in, I, we played music at the beginning, we showed this cartoon and uh, for 17 minutes, and I'll say a little bit more about that. And then that was followed by Roseanne and Joanne also sharing that work of what we've done with the, with the students. So there was a lot of disruption going on. And I think that's why it's also, I think it fits this webinar series because that's also a disruption of a kind. It was so troubling as uh, Donna Haraway would say. But I just felt that asking Brendan was really giving it to someone who would know what to do, not just as a way of articulating what I thought, but actually do something more than that, because I just so enjoyed um, and still enjoy the, uh, the cartoons that uh, Brendan creates every day. I mean, it's astounding really how, how you can do that. And then when uh, we talked about it at some point, uh, Brandon, you were just not, you were saying, you know, how many drawings had gone into it. And I thought, this is actually crazy. You know, we just so focus, me too, you know, on the product of what we do in academia. And wouldn't it be amazing just to share with others, you know, what, what is actually involved in, uh, in this particular, in its specificity, right? It's not something that we say, oh, we all want you to uh, to do a, a cartoon with Brandon. That's not the point, you know, the point is just what, how does the visual and the words work um, to affect the reader of this text in ways that maybe something else doesn't. And, and in particular, just sort of celebrating what Brandon uh, brought to this text. So just very quickly to say I was in Australia and uh, for six weeks uh, for a visiting professorship in Melbourne. And then uh, I just had to, Brennan said, 15 minutes and not longer. And it was, and I kept uh, you know, talking really fast and I thought, no, this is not gonna work. But the, the rigor involved in keeping cutting back, keeping cutting back, no, 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 what is it? What is my manifesto? What is it I want to say? What is it I want others to hear? Um, it was amazing, actually. And then I said to Brendan, uh, it's 17 minutes. Is that OK? <laughs> I can't make it shorter than 17 minutes. And then to my delight, he says, yeah, all right, that's fine then. <laughs> I'll hand over Brendan. Brendan, so maybe you can respond to Karen. And maybe some of it could be um, Karen basically sent you the script. It was literally a Word document just with words 17 minutes of words and then you had to do something with that so can you share and, and part of that is your process of how you usually take the language of the world and make it into your language of, of images and pictures that are provocative and controversial but also very powerful and beautiful so can you tell us something about your process and just to tell everyone watching we also going to be brand will be sharing um some of the production techniques essentially that he used. So just, you know, stay tuned. That's gonna be, we'll be popping those in soon. So Bren, over to you. Um, oh, sorry, Rose, Bren. Sam, just, just one minute. Does everyone have access to the text? Because when you go to, yeah, when you go to the internet, you go to the Post-Human Child Manifesto, you see the YouTube clip. And then underneath it, you can clip on the actual text. And I was asked to do that, especially for people using it for teaching when English is not their, foreign, their first language. Um, Great. And the links are in the, um, is in the chat. Thanks, Brandon, over to you. Oh yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, thanks for those kind words uh, about my work. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so so getting, uh, talking to Karen about this, doing this project, um, I had, in my mind initially, because I had done something uh, a few months earlier, was to do it as a PowerPoint presentation, 
because I, I kind of assumed it would be a presentation and um, that way Karen could control telling the story and just playing the visuals when she felt she needed to display them. So um, I'd done a, a previous presentation for a, a, another professor in that sort of way, which worked quite well in, in his presentation. And I thought we'd, we'd probably do the same here. Um, but um, but actually, Karen, then just before just before the deadline, <laughs> she, she said, no, no, let's rather record my voice so that we have a voice, um, the, the entire story uh, recorded, that'd be better. And then you would just uh, illustrate the whole talk in, in that linear kind of fashion. And um, so that was a, uh, quite a, I mean, a challenge for me because I hadn't, I hadn't been thinking about it in that, in that sort of way. And um, it, it, it actually became a lot easier to turn into, into this one film because um, it, it wasn't going to be in, in a, in, you know, if, if we do it in a PowerPoint kind of way, it would have been lots of little individual forms that were placed on this timeline at various places that uh, Karen would then engage with as she was presenting. Um, so this was a completely different way of doing it, um, but, but, but yet it, it gave me a lot more control. So looking at Karen's script, um, I, I was, yeah, there was, I was quite confident that I would come up with a, a way of visualizing it because it was in, it's in such visual language. Um, it was, it was quite, it was quite easy to um, translate, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and Karen had lots of, um, and, and the subject matter was in itself was quite unique. I mean, it, it's something one doesn't get to do every day. So, um, so I was quite excited by that, and I, I didn't feel um, any, you know, intimidated by the the text in in that in that way. So I thought, no, no, this this will actually be a lot of fun. And then, um, yeah, as soon as Karen came back from Australia, we had a I had a sit down right next to my desk and uh, have recorded a doing the voiceover, which wasn't very, uh, I mean, it wasn't a, a studio kind of quality recording, but we had to do with what we could at the time, and. Um, uh, I put I put some processes through it so it didn't sound uh, as as stark as the recording, but it's uh, it's it's it is what it is right now. So um, that's what we used, and um, so so to kind of you know, a good way to visualize the way I, I would work and, and put this together was almost like a clothesline. So 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 Karen's um, voice recording um, file would be kind of the washing line, and I would just hang various garments along the way, you know, as, as this, this visually exactly, that's exactly how this thing looks um, once you put it together as a form. Um, and um, so, so, so it was, was quite, you know, intuitive the, uh, the way we, we worked. Um, and then I didn't really do it in, uh, in a linear fashion, like I suppose like most forms are done. I mean, I, you know, sort of started the first one. Uh, I, I sort of went through it and said, "What's the easiest one to do?" Because <laughs> because one has to get started and 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 one one has to kind of get sort of uh, a, a a critical mass going, so you feel like you you know achieving something. So uh, so it wasn't exactly that small, but I thought, okay, which is the uh, which is which which piece am I most excited about drawing right now? And I started with that, and I think it was um, somewhere in the middle. Um, because that's you know that's just how it was, and um, and then that kind of it, it helps once once you finish that it kind of helps you put this thing together. So like I said, it's like a bare clothes line, and then you're sticking on little garments as you finish them, as you make them, you kind of hang them up and peg them on this line. Um, so eventually it it filled up the whole line, which was uh, the the end end product. So. Um, yeah, so to show you the, um, I can what I what I'm going to do is just switch to uh, I use a program called Dragon Frame, which is a, a quite a well known um, uh, stop motion recording software. So it's it's very good. I, I obviously tried a few uh, different kinds of softwares to, to see what would work for me, and and this kind of made the most intuitive sense. Um, and the big thing was that I, it could. It's a, it's a, it would allow me to reverse the camera image as I was working, uh, which was quite important because the way this was set up was I was drawing on this um, on this erase tablet, um, a blackboard uh, whiteboard tablet, and um, 
the, the camera was suspended above directly above the the, the drawing surface and of course um I, I had to attach the camera to in this direction and not not sort of behind me it couldn't come over my head uh and and be above my head um you know uh, recording because you know I, I i i would i couldn't have a wall behind me i needed space behind me to work so i couldn't i had to have the camera in front of me so the camera was actually in the wrong orientation so i had so this software just has a little button and you click and then you are reversed which which was perfect so i could have the camera in the reverse position but it would be recording on this um, software system in the right orientation, which was quite important. Um, and then okay, you just, you, oh, sorry, yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Before you, yeah, it's a good question. Maybe you could just explain about why you chose to draw on the white board and just, that's quite important actually too. And then we'll talk about the number of drawings. You can maybe throw that in now, the number of um, images we created mm. to you. Thanks. Oh yeah, that was that was another decision based on on a, the project I did before, which I did on paper. I drew on paper and recorded the process. Uh, but then, of course, I was left with uh, piles of drawing, um, which I had. Uh, I realized I had no, which had no other use uh, once the um, once the process was completed. So, I thought I'd try and do this with a, with the whiteboard, and uh, not so much that I do erase it, but it also. I, want, I wanted to also uh, the, the 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 way the ink sticks to a whiteboard is so very different to paper um, in in the way that it it's it's almost a, a permanent it's like drawing on paper is something I'm quite familiar with so I thought let me try and do this on whiteboard which is a bit more um, a little harder to to make into a hard line and um, would also then um lend itself more to um it, it made it much softer and i could i could then try a few other techniques mixed in with that which would make it more interesting like um using bits of cut out paper and a couple of other techniques I also tried um to you know illustrate various parts so so that was the consideration and of, of course it, it, it then meant i didn't have a pile of paper drawings afterwards um so all these sections were drawn and then erased. Um, and of course, I mean, it wasn't just done once. Uh, most of these, uh, the way I would, would, would set it up was I'd, I'd choose um, which garment I was going to work on uh, along the clothesline and then do one, one take of the whole thing, try and draw the whole thing. And then invariably it wouldn't be, wouldn't work properly the first time or I'd come up as I was drawing it, I'd, come up with a different idea of a different way of saying it and then I would start to you know delete all of those frames wipe the board clean and start again which was quite quite a nice way of working and just just you know spiritual kind of sense you could just kind of wipe it clean and start again and um, also delete all the photographs that were used in the process because there's uh, but but they're all they all kind of work together they all help me to to do the final one because um they were always based on each other so you know one even though the so they were all erased after each um recording session the the remnants of of those earlier drawings all came through to the last version as well and um, they all kind of made it into the end product um even though they were erased long way just to just something a little mind bending i thought i'd throw in. <laughs> okay yeah there's a lot happening here okay I think visually we need to see some of what you're talking about, even though we've seen the post human. So I interrupted you, but do you want to pick up that um, that image that you were going to share with us? Oh yeah, sure. Let me just okay. jump to. I think it's the one with this. the arena we thought you are. Yeah. Um, so those who've been waiting in the waiting room, I'm trying to see, and I didn't. Um, please just shout if somebody's in the waiting room. You can just interrupt and say Rose and Chick. It's not that clear. Thank you. But apologies to those who've been outside. Karen, I don't know if you want to say something there or Bram, before Bram picks up the, um, are you muted, Karen? Are you muted? That was for the train. Uh, I could, maybe you can make Brendan speak for the recording. Okay. Um, Brandon, I'm, I'm going to, oh, well, that's you now. Sorry. Oh, yeah, you're going to, yeah. you're going to enlarge the frame. Okay. Yeah, so there's a different setting, isn't it? 
is the, mm-hmm. as soon as we stop talking, he'll become bigger. Yeah. Or I can pin him. Let me do that. Okay. Yeah. I think pin- yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay, Bram, you want to tell us what you're doing? With yeah. The- so- oh, sorry. It hasn't made a difference. Yeah, Karen, what it's done is every time you and I talk, we are not being um, made much bigger. So Bram, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so so how this this worked was um, the, the the frames were fed into this um, into this kind of uh, file hierarchy, which um, uh, which is, is set up to to do this. So so each take has a folder, and then um, in each folder we've got the the feed, which is the actual live photographs that um, uh, that that we would um, uh, that that would be used uh, in in the form, and um, I just want to show you very quickly um, how this looks. Oh yeah, so so I'm just going to um, I'm just going to switch over to another scene. Um, Okay. Yeah, yeah, it seems. Uh, okay. I think it's fine to do what you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. That's not it. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Um, Okay, uh, sorry, I've, I've lost my, my way around that. Um, so yeah, so if, if I could just show you, these are the, the frames as they come through the program. And then uh, what happens is they, they get um, flipped over to the right way and I'm then able to manipulate it in this way. So this is how the frames are sort of framed is the, the the kind of bounding areas that you would choose to use and then i would change the speed and the timing um etc um as as i need um so that gave me quite a lot of uh, you know creative room to to play with um so this is pretty much how it comes in through the program and uh, you're able to then play around with the speed and and the way it, it displays and the size it, it displays at um, and I could do that for each individual um, section. Um, there's, uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and I recorded it at um, a speed of about yeah, 15 frames a second um, that they came into the program. And, um, they, uh, and then you, you play it back at normal speed and it's, it's obviously then comes through as a much speeded up work. So yeah, so in all we, uh, created something like uh, fifteen thousand frames of of uh, of these uh, the of, of these images. Um, some some have simply you know like a couple of almost a thousand frames to it uh, because uh, you know I wouldn't use all of them. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. So it just became quite vast. But th- this is how you manage them and and how you. You use what you you just need to use. Um, I can let me just show you a couple more. Um, just switch the take. One with, if you could okay, I'm gonna go to. I think Karen wants to, want to talk to that one, maybe. Oh wait, but let's go back to this one, um, and then Karen can can talk us uh, through the thinking behind this. Okay. Um, so this is. Um, development appropriate practice. Um, yeah. yeah, particularly just like the way Brendan um, sort of visualized or articulated, not just um, how mature male 
rational uh, human being is, is the norm um, in which our young children, including girls, need to uh, grow up in. But you know, the, the swallowing, um, how that expresses the, uh, the colonizing nature of, of, the, of that doing, of those acts, but then the, the conveyor belt as well. And to what extent, so using the conveyor belt as expressing um, education, and there is so much there that uh, is almost impossible to articulate in words. And so what is fascinating here is that it, it, it's, it's the other way around. So it was an expression of the words and that's what Brendan was doing rather than uh, just an idea that would be visualized and then trying to find the words for it. It's incredibly clever. It's, it's just so beautiful because also the stark uh, difference between the feminine and the masculine also comes out so beautifully in terms of the static and the movement and and I'm sure that people watching this will have a very good um, other ideas as well to read this text. Um, Karen, do you want to ask Brandon to do one other one? Do you want to do the recapitulation? And um, Brandon, remember that? Well, I think that is one of the striking ones, which was also picked up uh, last week in uh, the session. And I noticed that Hillary um, is there as well is the yeah the the how do you express the, the the very close connection between the logic of childhood and the logic of colonialism and how whole continents like africa are being treated as child you know as so how does child as a concept work uh, to marginalize to colonize and and i think it's a really important uh, point because especially, um, yeah, this one is just so incredibly um, powerful, the way uh, this is, she's Nandi, is how, how the, the, the changing of the child, the young child into the chimpanzee, you know, it's here. I mean, how, how that is done. Um, and it's so economical, it's beautiful here, yeah, child and savage and how, uh, you know, as a recapitulation theory is how the child has to mature as an individual, so has to recapitulate um, the, uh, the history of mankind, mankind, to become this mature adult, male, um, able-bodied, heterosexual, etc. So it, it's, it's beautiful, and, and for people who are not familiar with, with my work and of other people now as well is how child and age is still not really on the agenda of lots of post-humanists either um, as a category of so age as a category of exclusion so I mean this image for me is just so powerful and then Brandon do you want to do one last one and then I'm going to ask people to think of some questions and then we're going to talk about how the post-human um Child manifesto has been used in teaching and that we're keeping for just right near the end. So think of some questions you want to ask Brandon or Karen. And Brandon's going to just pick up one more, the one about Africa, I think it is. We all know that one. Okay. Oh, the one that, about cutting? Yeah, cutting. Got it. Yeah, that was picked, that was picked up last week as well. Um, you know how we tend to cut children's development up into bits. And you see that in a minute, you know, the different parts of the, <laughs> of the body, emotional needs and cognitive and physical and people I'm sure very familiar with it in the room. <laughs> yeah, so, so these concepts just led itself to fairly, you know, great graphic expression and, um, yeah, I uh, must thank Karen for a very visual manifesto. Um, it was uh, it was a real um, it was a real lot of fun to try and visualize. I'd say visual and conceptual because the concept, Brandon, was so deep and complicated actually for you to kind of go, oh, what's happening. Um, and so besides you seeing it visually, but I mean, you I think maybe you see your concepts visually possibly in the first place. I'm not saying you can't don't see them 
otherwise. But yeah, that could be that could be it. But I'm going to I'm going to remove the pin on you, Brandon, and just ask: Is there any <laughs> people a minute to ask a question, and then we're going to talk about how we have used this in our teaching in different places and spaces. So I'm going to do that. Um, Okay, so is anyone in the room, in the Zoom room, um, do you have any, do you have a question about the process? The, yeah, just for either Brandon or Karen. Nikki. Oh yeah, Nikki, thanks, okay. Hi Nikki, you're still muted, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. I always forget to unmute. I'm so sorry. Hello, everybody. So I uh, firstly, thank you for the presentation. And it's been really nice having an opportunity to return, as Karen said, looking, I was there last week and coming to this now. And Karen, what I'm curious about is whether it's changed how the, the film has changed your thinking or affected your thinking. Because if we if we're looking at the drawings as materialize manifestations, conceptual manifestations or materializations, then how has it changed your, yeah, how has it moved your thinking, if that makes sense, if it has? Thanks, Nikki. Wow, that's a good question. Um, You see, what, do, what does the visual do? It really helps to connect and get affected, I'm so affected by the material. And I suppose I have seen how it works with uh, my students. And, um, and so there is a, there's a constant reminder, but I think, you see, there, there are so many, and, and these are just a few examples of of ways in which it was um visualized that i hadn't imagined you know so it's not that i had a visual image in my mind and then i said to brennan oh can you draw this for me because i can't draw um, it was much more creative what brennan has done so it he it actually brought me new ideas in the sense of well it, it, it's the compactness almost which then helps you to remember it so i think i i, I was i was very nervous to profess you know if is this really what i profess but i think in the doing i i sort of became more courageous in thinking yeah i do and i and, and the fact that this was really important because although brendan knows a lot about post-humanism through Roseanne and you know you, you can't help not be affected especially not when you live with Roseanne you know with all these ideas and but still it's very very difficult stuff right it's very complex stuff and and the fact that my 17 minutes made some sense I think gave me so much um hope and, and courage that I wasn't completely daft, you know, that maybe it really is something worth <laughs> saying and saying it in ways that I could possibly, I couldn't, I could never do. Um, and I think the, the combination is, is, is um, I don't want to use cliche words, see what I can find something else, but it is the com combination, maybe a Baradian superposition, you know, and how these waves have come together and have created something um, that neither of us could do on our own. And I think it is a, it's an expression of a very, very powerful um, teamwork. Um, and especially considering the circumstances. And when I heard about the 15,000 um frames and i thought oh my word what did i do you know what did i dare to ask someone to do and uh but yeah very grateful and and i can see you know i'm I, instead of getting tired of it maybe like a lot of work you know real art is that i get more and more fond of it um so it's not as if i get bored or tired with it at all and uh and i'm very proud of it now 
so when I teach with it, I feel, yeah, you know, I don't have to um, quickly, you know, move on to another PowerPoint. I feel that there is, is a, um, so much there to offer and, uh, and to think about and to engage with and to provoke. It really is there to provoke and to think with. Uh, but thanks for the question, Nikki. It's a very, very good question. I don't know what Brendan wants to <laughs> add, maybe. Yeah, you muted, Brendan. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, yeah, great, great question, uh, Nikki. Um, I think um, it's, yeah, it certainly helped me understand this, this work um, a lot better because I was I was trying to visualize it so um, uh, it, it certainly helped me to um, yeah to figure what this was all about and um, uh, yeah and I, I suppose I would recommend uh, anyone trying to get to grips with this to to do a little animation of it <laughs> of, <laughs> of about 17 minutes that'll certainly help but um, but yeah jokes aside, it was um, yeah, it was a, a very, um, uh, it, it was a definitely a very steep learning curve, but um, it, it, gave, yeah, it gave me a lot of confidence to tackle a lot of the other things that I've, I'm continuing to work on, um, you know, and not, not feel intimidated by the material ever. Um, that's given me a lot of confidence in, in my work, daily work as well. So it's, it's been, yeah, it's been a wonderful project. Thanks, Brandon. And we have another question from Lalu, so thanks. Can, if you'd like to thank yes um thank you so much um really tr uh, interesting i just like to ask uh, brendan what what form what form of format is this because sometimes i get uh, confused be between um um is this is this animation when when stories get to be alive like that i just need some kind of a, what do i name this because I found it, I was first introduced to just learning around uh, this con context of, of education by, <laughs> now I can't remember, but uh, I'd like to know the form. Thank you so much, beautiful. Thanks, Thanks Lalu. Um, yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, this is really, uh, what this is usually called is a whiteboard animation, which, uh, which is the way this is done. Um, but I think, the animation in itself uh, is really anything um, that normally uh, that that sort of moves and creates itself as it's going through its its motion. Um, so it includes this this kind of work as well. Although it's it may, it may not be strictly um, uh, you know film animation or or stop motion or um, or some of the more classical types of animation. Um, it is a kind of animation because it's showing. Uh, moving and something changing state uh, over time, uh, which which is pretty much the principle of, of all animation. Um, so so it's a it's a very crude form of animation, but it is one anyway. Um, and yeah, it's it, it is called whiteboard animation. If you if you you know Google that, you'll find quite a lot of people who who do that around the world. Um, but um, but yeah, it's it's all part of the the, the big umbrella of animation. Just before we start, before I hand over to Karen again, so Brian, but it's, it is interesting though when I think about this because of the drawing. So there's something else that happened with the drawing. And then when you talked about how the whiteboard holds on, I mean, we think about ontology and how this is remembered in the whiteboard, in the movement of your hand, in the cloth that is now 300 different colors because of all the wiping and how you've, you know, you talk about time, but there's something that's You've done things in reverse, you've done things the right way around. And I mean, the whole point of some of this is how we're disrupting unilinear time. So just it, there's so much, you know, can we call it animation when there's all these other, and I'm not saying we, we don't or we shouldn't, but how um, it's, it's interesting the naming does something um, to what it is we are in and part of anyway. But that's just a comment, I suppose, because I'm aware of time. We have um, nine minutes and we have Hilary Jenks. I'm going to give Hilary a opportunity to ask a question and then Karen will share. Um, Hilary, thanks, welcome. Thanks, uh, Roseanne. It's just a comment. I was just struck when, with Brandon's definition of animation, something moving and changing state all the time. It's a great definition of becoming. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah i think he said creates itself i was also quite struck by that yeah and hillary you want to you want to make another comment about that or you know that's all i'm putting my hand down thanks vicky you back yeah just to think a little bit further with the notion of animation as kind of bringing to life an animating conversation animating thought um, mm. I think that's that's quite an important um, for me at any rate. It 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 there's a resonance there for me. Yeah. Thank you. This is all very helpful. These and um, when we all come back to this recording, well, somebody asked me. I said I, I watched the Post Human Manifesto many many times over and over. And if I could just mention, I don't know if some of you've noticed, but it has more than five thousand views on YouTube, which is very, we were talking to our librarian at UCT some years ago. That's a very good analytic for and what is considered an academic piece of work. So that's also really interesting about where this is going. And maybe Karen, if you could um, share, um, I have used this, I know Zern, not to put some people in the room, but I know Zern has used this for his um, teaching. Karen, do you wanna talk about what this has meant and how it has been used in the world and in the world of, of teaching with foundation phase teachers, your master's honors students in Olu, in South Africa, in Norway, um, and maybe just mention briefly the Farsi translation in seven minutes. Yeah, yeah. So I've used it for conference presentations, um, and sometimes I just use images from not just. I um, don't know whether you can see this. So this is comes yeah. from. Uh, this comes from one PowerPoint actually that I used uh, only a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a, a, a it's in childhood studies in, at the University of Oulu where I'm teaching at the moment, and what you can see it probably is too small to read, but at the heart of this work is really how nature is uh, or what culture needs to provide a child. Uh, because child lacks by nature. So that the whole thing, the way the nature culture binary works, and you can see that Brendan has got that up as well, is how, and putting together, and Roseanne, this is your idea actually, is taking these, uh, these figurations out of uh, the manifesto and just see how they work um, with students. So what you can see here is developing child, ignorant child, and this is also drawing on, on Rosa Bardotti's work, but I, I can't really go into that. This is very much in a book called Post-Human Child, uh, but I've been playing with this for many years, actually. I've also changed my mind. It's not quite as it was in the Post-Human Child. I, I, I changed some of it as I was returning to it. But I think probably for a lot of people in education, what's on the right-hand side or in social work or work with children is very familiar, like maturation, guidance, mediation, instruction, training. So the, the students I work with, the most of them, but not all of them are in early childhood or they sometimes do education research or they work in one capacity or another with children. So it is broader than, than just that. And the way I work with it is not just, oh, here is uh, the manifesto, um, which, for example, oh, well, I mean, that can also be really good. So I did it in a presentation, as uh, Roseanne was referring to, uh, in the uh, University of Shiraz in Iran. Uh, unfortunately, it was COVID, so I couldn't come, but um, I had a keynote there for a uh, conference on children's literature and they were fascinated how um, my work in children's literature and with picture books and how I, I use these ideas um, that are in the post human child uh, manifesto in the context of that. Um, and uh, so it has been the post human child manifesto has been translated in, in Farsi and it will be put on the uh, on the website. Uh, in due course, but that's it's amazing actually to listen to. And then also then you start to think, well, what, what does it do if I don't hear my own voice, but you hear a voice that, you know, your language that I don't understand myself. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, the invitation to, to create other uh, figurations, you know, of Charles and how they work. And that's really an open invitation. But with my uh, students, then what I give them is we work with materials um, <laughs> routinely, actually. So here, what you can see, and this comes from the post-human child, where uh, the students then start to think about, well, how have these figurations worked in my life and still work 
their way through, you know? So to what extent going back to these is, you know, the way you are still treated as an ignorant child or an evil child or a developing child, you know, when you were little and still uh, manifests itself. So it's disrupting this whole idea that it was in the past or something in the future, but how in the now, the, the past and the future are always threaded through. And, um, and then they express that in their kind of body, mind maps, mattering, you know, it's much more than that, of course, because it's, yeah, it, it, it is limited by it. Uh, and and how these these figurations still these discourses still work their the way through in in uh, the way they see themselves and we very much link that to the way they see themselves as teachers you know and uh, and see their learners and here you can see it with um, a black student who used brown paper to express other ideas and how also I love the texture here she she'd use rocks um, and how heavy some of these figurations were in a material discursive way so you can see those students um, very much steeped into into post humanism and here is very much how, how binaries such as race and binary still work um, in students lives um, as they are becoming teachers. So this gives you just some idea, and I, I still work with it a lot, and, and I've also, Rosanna, it was really your idea to, when I also did my inaugural for Olu, that I just focused on those six, because actually they, they are so rich in themselves, um, as a way of, we were thinking about that this morning in a reading group, you know, about these genealogies and how uh, they are political and you know how they keep working um in the everyday in everything we do in education and um, um thank you i don't want to interrupt you but i know we had said for those who arrived late we said we would try and finish probably close to five but we have one more question so i hope you don't mind taking that and then just a final comment from you and brandon so claire if you'd like to thanks for your patience i didn't see it earlier would you like to share your question please welcome no, uh, thank. It's it's not so much a question. It's actually a comment um, about how this is being used. Because um, a while back at the preschool I was working at, we were looking at very much of changing. I, I live in England, so we were kind of under the uh, early years foundation stage curriculum, um, or I did at the time, and we were looking to change how we did our practice to move towards more post-human, out of sort of the neoliberal curriculum, how we were going to manage that. And we were getting quite a lot of kickback from um, from parents as to, but my child isn't going to learn to count to 10 and all the thing, great things that, are, that that kind of curriculum states that we need to be doing. And so we had all sat down as practitioners, well, how are we going to explain why this is important? And we're thinking, well, how are we going to explain concepts of neoliberalism, of economic value, of worth of children? And what we decided to do was have a parents evening and we got them all parents in, we got them all snacks and we played them this video. Yeah. And what happened was when, we, when it came to the bit with the gentleman with the conveyor belt eating the ballerina, one of the parents stood up and said, well, that's not my child. <laughs> my child, that's not going to happen to them. And it started this really big democratic process within the nursery, along with parents as to, and they were kind of really kind of unfounded as too strong, but as to say, but there's more than one type of knowledge. What type of knowledge is, well, what are we looking at? Where, where are we going with, with, with children within this space? And it started this kind of co-creation. So yeah, for even for parents and practitioners, rather than trying to go into the very kind of, and this is what this is, and this is what this means when you put them together. And it's very difficult to see, this was brilliant. Mm. Wow. So That's just want we need to chat some more. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. My children were at parents in Ogrel, and I suggest showing your own children if you want to. I find this work ironically deeply political. I'm not, not, I don't mean ironically in a strange sense, but the work is, Brandon's work is, he's an editorial cartoonist, which is very political. And this work is very political, actually, um, Parents Manifesto. And, and so that's really important in terms of, well, certainly where I come from. In terms of when I think about Karen Barad's work being very political, it's all about justice, thinking about justice so differently. Sorry, I didn't mean to speed all that up quickly, but I'm... <laughs> <laughs> As I'm talking... <laughs> okay, so um, Karen and then Brandon, maybe just some last careful <laughs> words from both of you. 
as we end. Karen or Brandon? Oh, Shane, Brandon, you still? Yeah, yeah, maybe Karen. Karen can wrap it up. Uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks. I really enjoyed getting some uh, some feedback and how people use this and um, how people felt about certain parts of it. Um, and yeah, it's been really enriching to, to get lots of feedback. And um, I, I, I do appreciate that. It was uh, really surprising. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly something very special to me, this, uh, this little form. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be carrying it uh, with me forever. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of those things, um, it's, it certainly has uh, opened many doors for me and um, it continues to be a, something that I do, um, yeah, I do enjoy um, touching on from time to time. So I really have enjoyed the feedback and the discussion around this. Thank you. And Karen, is it the last time? Wow, well, it's just I'm quite um, moved by it, to be honest. And yeah, and overwhelmed actually, but also, also a sense of gratitude. You know, these, these ideas sometimes that just come like that. And yeah, yeah, good idea. And then later on and still and more so and especially this event as well is is yeah it really affects me and um and feel incredibly grateful actually brendan very grateful thank you yeah so just to say thank you everyone just yeah um please watch the film it's great advice from claire to share that well you know let's keep the conversation going amongst each other and yeah, let's continue to do um, important work. So thanks everyone for being here, for your time today. And hopefully we'll see you in the series as we return to what it is we will come to know differently every time we return. Thanks. Thank you, Roseanne. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Bye -bye. everyone. Thanks, Ro thanks Roseanne. Thanks, thanks um, Karen. Uh, shame, and I'm out. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Angela. Thanks. Oh, Renat. Razen, thanks, Kandiwe and Ibeta. Um, and Shame, we actually started at four and we're finishing, sorry, we finished early. We were going to finish it off at five. Thanks, Helen. Um, but there is, you know, the recording is available, so it will be made available. Thanks, everyone. That's, maybe we should put the date. It's Monday, the 21st of February, 2022.